It's late August and it's a perfect time for us to learn a little bit about monarch butterflies and especially the caterpillars and what they're doing this time of year. And I'm actually going to chat with Carrie Ausler, who is a Lepidoptera enthusiast. She's been fascinated with caterpillars and butterflies and moths since age seven. So let's see what she's got to share. All right. Hi, Carrie. I am so excited to learn about monarchs. And I mentioned a minute ago, you've been interested in butterflies and caterpillars since you were a little, little girl. How did that all start? Well, um, my mom, it started with my mom. When I was little, about four years old, my mom and I went for walks down the road and she would carry me, or she'd run me along in a little wagon <laughs> and we'd see uh, Spilosoma virginica or um, Pyrarctia isabelle, which is the woolly bear and the Virginian tiger moths. Nice. We would see them crawling across the road and we were like, oh, they're so fuzzy and cute. I would pick them up and take them home and my mom would try to teach me how to feed them. I was a little young for that, but still tried. A couple years later, around age seven, my mom showed me how to find monarch caterpillars uh, underneath milkweed leaves. And okay. that was when it really started for that, me. That was really the trigger to get you into now this lifelong interest for it, butterflies and moths, right? It, it was. Yeah. I started to learn about what they could eat and how quickly they could change. And in that moment, well, during that time, I was essentially floored. I thought this was just the coolest thing in the world. They just change so fast. They're so beautiful. And the process of them to do all of that, it takes some patience. Um, mm -hmm. Depending on the time of year, it can be a couple of weeks to maybe even a month for monarchs to grow from egg to egg to adult. And um, that patience is also rewarding when you see the end result. When you go through the whole uh, observation, right? Beautiful. Home. And you're right now you're surrounded by your pollinator garden, so you have places for caterpillars to uh, feed. You have places for uh, butterflies and moths to lay eggs, which is great. But let's talk about these monarchs, which you basically have found um, right around in this area, and you are gracious enough to have multiple stages of the caterpillar. So uh, why don't you talk us through what you have and we'll take a look. All right. So I'm going to start with the first stage, which is the egg. <laughs> I was lucky enough to find multiple stages of this beautiful monarch butterfly. And so I want to show them to you all. We've got the egg here, which is laid on the underside of the milkweed leaf. Monarchs will only eat milkweed. It is their only host plant, and so you will oftentimes find them laying eggs under, on the underside of the leaf or on top of the leaf. And I like how the egg, it almost looks like when you look really close, it kind of looks like it has like these little striations, right, around yes. that oval. Yeah. Yes, it's got ridges, ridges just okay. very microscopic little ridges that just decorate the entirety, it's like a all beautiful around the little side. egg. Yes. And single, like it's a single egg yep. on, on the underside of a leaf. Okay, so when that hatches, then out comes an adorable little caterpillar, right? A little baby, yes. And you have a really tiny caterpillar, right? I do. I don't have a freshly hatched one, but I've got a couple little guys here. So tiny. The cool thing about monarchs is that for the most part, throughout their caterpillar stages, they look pretty much the same through each stage. They just look a little bit bigger. And this guy is not letting me interrupt his food. <laughs> he is eating away. It's great. And as they grow, they actually shed their skin, right? They do. And there's a term for like the, the, those stages or yes. those, right? What, what, what is that word? That is called an instar. Okay. An instar is a stage of growth that a, an insect in their larval stage will go through before pupation or before their adult stage. So for monarchs, they go through five instars before they reach adulthood. When they hatch out of that egg, they're in their first instar. And then after they shed their skin, they're in the second instar. And it goes on until their final instar, which is when they shed their skin for the final time and they become a chrysalis. Mm, okay, and we're gonna see that in just a minute, but you have more sizes of caterpillars in this uh, enclosure. I you do. Have. They get even bigger. We've got one right here. Oh, great. This Munchin. one? Yeah, so this guy's in his final instar. He is 
almost fully grown as a caterpillar. He's got a little bit of mass to put on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people say, hey, you know, I saw, I saw monarch caterpillars on my milkweed and then they were gone. Yes. So what's happening when that happens? So there's two things that could happen. The first thing is a bit unfortunate is if they got got by somebody. That could be yep. by an insect, by a bird, by an animal. Or they could have left to go make a chrysalis. Now a caterpillar, for a monarch caterpillar, they can travel up to 100 meters to go make a chrysalis. They will find their special spot and make a silk pad. And then they will make a silk button that they hang from. And then they will wait for about 48 hours preparing to shed their skin for that last time and then they become a chrysalis in there. Which is amazing, because I, I, I've watched that process and yes. like literally every time I watch it, like I really get, you still can't figure out how it happens. It's like magic, right? Once they, you see them yeah. pumping and you can start yeah. seeing the hemolymph, which is insect blood, you can see them pumping that hemolymph up and down their body as yeah. it's circulating, pumping through, and then you can see them just boom, 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 and their skin just splits, splits open, open and they're just, pushing and they yep. push that skin right off. And then there's a chrysalis, which is like, how does that happen? It's still amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Yes. And you actually do have some chrysalises. I do. Right? I don't I've even got... know. Is the plural of chrysalis chrysalises or chrysali? Uh, I don't know. I call them chrysalides. I've chrysalides. seen them as okay. chrysalides. Okay. Great. So we've got three of them here. Oh yeah. Hanging from the top. So literally the caterpillars in this case have just kind of crawled up to that screen and made their little button, as yes. you said. And now, um, how long will it take approximately for those to eclose? That's the right term, right? When the, right. when the butterfly comes out of the yep. chrysalis, how long does that take? Um, it can take about seven to 14 days, depending on the temperature. So if it's warmer, it's going to happen faster because their metabolic rate is going to increase. A caterpillar's body temperature reflects their environment. So if they're cold, if the environment is cold, they are also cold and it slows down their metabolic rate to where they're going to move more slowly, eat more slowly and grow more slowly. Mm -hmm. And if it's warmer, then they're going to eat more quickly, grow more quickly, and they will thus develop more quickly as well. Well, this generation, it's late August, actually, the very end of August. Will this generation uh, kind of move south? Is that what happens? Yes, this is going to be the super generation. So when they emerge, they are going to be considerably larger than your typical monarch that you would see in June or July. These guys have longer wings that are a little bit curved at the ends, almost like airplane wings so that they can ride tailwinds all the way down to Mexico. And that's where they'll spend the winter. That's right. right? Okay. Yep. And my understanding is when they're down there, they're kind of in a, like a, a st almost suspended animation, diapause maybe is the term. They don't, they just hang, right? Like they're literally just hanging. Right. So they are, they gather in clusters in the Oyamo fir forests and those they like fir trees mostly because of the humidity that can gather among the needles there um, and also the heat that can be kept in there but um, they cluster together and they wait until around until springtime so once winter ends their diapause is over they come out of hibernation and during that hibern during that uh, hibernation time they are they're exposed to colder temperatures where um, Sometimes it can even get to 32 degrees Fahrenheit at nighttime. So they are definitely hibernating. And then during the springtime, their reproductive organs activate and they suddenly burst forth and start breeding like crazy. And then they do a baton pass back up the States and into Canada so that they can move their reproduction rates and they can basically just move their uh, generations back up. The Okay, so basically it's a it's a multiple generations it of is. monarchs moving north yes. by the time we actually see them up here in early summer. That could be several generations from what left Mexico, exactly. right? Okay, yeah, yep. isn't that fascinating? I know, yeah. a lot of big travelers. Yes, many times people think that um, they do a one-way trip. They, do, they go all the way south and all the way up, but it's actually just a baton pass. Okay. Their lifespan becomes limited from that point once their reproductive organs start to activate. And so, um, 
And then once they lay eggs, that generation isn't the super generation, so they're a typical monarch where they have their regular reproductive abilities and they will basically fly north find more flowers and lay eggs on the milkweed that's there. Ah, that's great. I do want to talk just a minute. You've got this great um, mesh enclosure and you keep your caterpillars for the most part outside. Is that right? And that's why right. is that? So to keep them out, I keep my caterpillars outside after learning over the past few years of raising them indoors that raising them outdoors, it does expose them to a lot of benefits. So I keep mine um, that aren't in a mesh enclosure. They're on sleeves that are directly attached to the tree so that they get constant nutrients all the time. Um, the second that you take the plant or take a cutting from a tree, it starts to lose nutrients, it starts to lose water. And that can cause the caterpillar to um, become developmentally smaller. They can be a little bit smaller in size from what I've seen anyway in my personal experience. So um, I've decided that raising them outdoors, it does th give them a better advantage, and plus they're also exposed to the natural weather elements, which I think um, is crucial for monarchs because they do rely on the sun to, um, and thermoregulation, thermoregulative signals in order to guide them down south. Right, so being outside, they see sunlight, moonlight, what, they see all that natural daily rhythms. Right which most like as well as all the food benefits that exactly. helps them especially this generation mm -hmm. to move south exactly so that's great well this is really fascinating carrie i want to thank you so much for sharing what you know about monarchs anytime thanks don't forget to like outdoor elements on facebook so you can see all of our weekly webisodes and remember you can find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and natural areas. We'll see you soon.